at the end of yesterday's lecture, and some students reminded me as well, that I didn't give out any chocolates. But we had great interaction. As soon as I held it up, the room went silent. So that was yesterday's content. Um, you are, of course, welcome to ask questions at any time. Um, I'm going to try and... You're asking a question. Having technical difficulties? No worries. Are we getting it down on the recording? If the recording's working, that's fine. We'll upload the lecture later. Um, I think the live experience is best. Good. Were there any other questions? <laughs> Excellent. Let you go. Ooh. Well done. I like it. It is now. That was well pointed out. Thank you for that. And what was your name? Isaac. Isaac. Thank you, Isaac. I will, I will do it. There you go. Well done. Yep. Th thank you for contributing to our, um, our understanding as a class. All right. So I will flip through this quickly because we have already covered it, but this is like the, this is a very thermodynamic, typical thermodynamics type question or a part of a thermodynamics question. So we're talking about changing the state so going from one state to another state, in this case through a boiler, and we're saying how much energy do we need to put into the boiler? And then we're going to put it through a turbine, and we're going to say, well, how much work will we get out of the turbine? Right? This is pretty classical. Um, we're leading into thermodynamic cycles, um, in this case a, a steam power plant, obviously. Um, and so we did part of that. We flipped through some tables, table, table, table. Excellent, and we calculated the first part of that question. Um, I'd, I have the solutions this time, so I don't have to be so loose, loose on my mathematics, but um, I do prefer it when people shout out. So we added about 2,500 kilojoules per kilogram of flow, right? so that's a kilogram of um, water flowing through the boiler. We added 2.5 megajoules per kilogram in order to boil it from 60 degrees to whatever it was at 10 megapascals, 311 degrees of saturated steam. Okay, And now the question is, let's run that through a turbine um, and how much work will a turbine give us? So think, keep 2.5 megajoules in your head um, and we'll back refer to it. The steam then passes through a turbine where the pressure is reduced isentropically to one megapascal, what's the final state of the fluid? Now, isentropic, we haven't covered entropy yet, but this is a use of it, this is our main use of it in thermodynamics. Isentropic just means that the entropy doesn't change during the process. So if we had, we said it was 10 megapascals and we said it was a saturated vapor, so the entropy um, is 5.615 at that state. If we reduce the pressure and don't change the entropy, because isentropic, so we, we'll define that term later on. So if we reduce the pressure from 10 megapascals to 1 megapascal without changing the entropy, then we find that the entropy is somewhere between 2.14 and 6.6. .6. Kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin is the units, but um, Numerically, 5.6 is somewhere between 2.1 and 6.6. .6. And so the question then is, well, what's the property? Um, what's the state of the fluid? And so we can't do that yet. We'll need to introduce quality, which is where we'll go now, because quality means it's not a saturated fluid and it's not a saturated vapor. That's somewhere in between. Uh, and we'll also need to do something called interpolation which is what I'll spend the rest of the hour on. And this is pretty much where we're going to rest um, for the whole time we're together. So that was the end of concept 32. Um, and we'll kick on to quality as a property. Excellent. Just shout out if you've got anything to contribute. If you've got any questions, let me know if I'm going too fast. What, was, what did I define quality as when we were together yesterday? I mentioned it. Percentage of, that's basically like the composition of the fluid that you get. 
um, then your quality is quite close to zero because quality is a measure of mass, not a volume. Okay, so volumetrically, you'd look at that and go, oh, it's 50% vapor, it's 50% liquid. Well, the liquid is more massive in this container, so the quality is quite low. Um, once you get to about 50% quality, you start talking about droplets of water um, suspended in air. So I think that's just interesting diagrammatically because um, it's not necessarily intuitive how you would think um, quality is measured. So here's an example of a question. 65 kilograms of water is contained in a tank with a volume of one meter cubed at 300 degrees C. So you've got an overall volume, you've got a temperature, and you've got a mass. So mass and volume, you've got a specific volume, and you've got a temperature. So these are two independent intrinsic properties so that we have affirmatively defined the state of the substance. And the question is, what's the state of the substance, what's the quality of the substance? So that's the question we'll move to after we've talked a little bit about quality. We represent quality with letter X. It's not a mistake. And it represents the mass fraction of gas, so the vapor part um, of a substance, pure substance, divided by the overall mass of substance that you have. Okay, so that's, um, that's our formal definition. It looks like the ratio of two lines if you're doing things graphically. It looks like the ratio of different numbers if you're doing things as a calculation. If the quality is zero, that means the it's a saturated liquid. So if the quality is zero, all of the substance is liquid. And if you cool it anymore, it'll become subcooled. If you add any energy, it'll become a mixture. The quality will ri rise. So it's saturated liquid. If the quality is one, it's a saturated vapor. If you remove any energy, some liquid will condense out, or if you increase the pressure, some liquid will condense out. If you increase the energy, you'll um, go into the superheated vapor. Right? And quality only exists between those two states. So if you have a compressed liquid, you don't have a negative quality. If you've got a superheated gas, superheated vapor, you don't have a quality of 1.2. It's bounded by those terms. So quality is a, is a term that only exists within that range. And when you think about it, if you say the quality of steam, right, and you're trying to generate power, you would say high quality steam, a large number, is steam that's got lots of energy, we can use it. Right? Low quality steam is steam that has liquid water in it, it's got lower energy, it's less useful. So quality as a, as a term, as a word, kind of makes sense. Um, To calculate it, so this is if you're using numbers, okay, you can take some property denoted here as phi, and if we know what that property is at the saturated fluid state, and we know that prop what that property is at the saturated gas state, okay, so this is the property value at the saturated fluid state, this is the property value at the saturated gas state, vapor state, and of course, liquid state. Notice here this is a for example, Hg minus Hf, which on our tables is listed as, I think it's Hfg, might be Hgf, right? But your table specifically lists for enthalpy H and for entropy S, a Hfg and an Sfg figure, so you don't have to do this subtraction all the time. I kind of mentioned that yesterday when we were talking about tables. So if you know the value of the property, and then you know what the value would be if it was a saturated fluid or a saturated gas, then you can calculate the quality X. And this is true for all properties phi, okay? So in our question case, where we've got specific volume. So knowing the specific volume, we can calculate the specific entropy. We can calculate the enthalpy. We can calculate the internal energy um, using the same formula. We just make a different term the subject. Um, in this, x is the subject of the formula. If we make phi, which where phi is any of these, the subject of the formula, then it always works. Um, I've just put a little note here. If you know the pressure and or the temperature, that doesn't help you calculate x because quality exists only when you have a saturated mixture. 
if you have a saturated mixture, you know the pressure and temperature because they are not independent at that state. So this is what I was saying before. If you use some property, phi, to calculate x, then you can calculate some other property, theta, using x just by rearranging the equation. I'm heavy on concepts. I didn't actually present this equation last session because I just derive it each time I use it. And people said, well, what's the equation? So that's, that's the equation, um, if that helps. So let's try and answer this question. 65 kilograms of water is contained in a tank with volume at one meter cubed. What is the state of the fluid? Ba, 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 ba. Excellent, good, good. So we're at 300 degrees C, which is there. And so one of our independent intensive properties is temperature, which is excellent. The other independent intensive property, I propose is specific volume, excellent. What's the formula for specific volume? What's the formula for any specific property? Excellent, good. That property divided by mass. We've got the volume. We've got the mass. We're going to get a small decimal. I know you all aren't going to call out, so I wrote the figure down. Five meters cubed per kilogram. All right. 0 0.015. Excellent. From this, we can observe that 0 0.015 is more than 0 0.0014, this property here, this value here, and it's less than. 0.021, right? So because it's between those two properties, the quality, the substance will have a quality, okay? If it was more than, so say, let's just take a different hypothetical case, right? Say you got a volume of, a specific volume of 0.04, right? Meters cubed per kilogram. What would that indicate to you about the substance? Cool. That it's a, no, it's a superheated vapor. So if it was saturated, it would have a volume of exactly this, specific volume, of exactly that. If the specific volume is greater than that, then it's a superheated vapor. So we haven't, not, we haven't changed the temperature, but we've just rarefied it a bit more. Remember, superheated vapor means if I compress it just a little bit, or if I take a little bit of heat out of it, it's not just about to condense. Okay, saturated means it's just about to condense. That's true of all of the properties. So you see that the UF properties are smaller than the UG properties. So if you have some property, pressure or temperature, and you're given a UF, and it's between those two values, you're dealing with a saturated mixture. If it's less than the value under UF, then you're dealing with a condensed or compressed liquid. If it's greater than the value on the right, you're dealing with a superheated vapor. And that's true also of enthalpy H, right? The smaller numbers on the left, the bigger numbers on the right. It's also true of entropy S. The smaller numbers on the left, the bigger numbers on the right. If you've got a number bigger than the number on the right, superheated vapor. Sorry, my, my, what I'm writing on is rotated with respect to what you're writing on. Superheated vapor, compressed liquid. I want to try and make that association directional because that's how you'll see it in the charts. Cool, so let's get rid of that. So because it is, get rid of some markings, because it is less, greater than the number on the left and less than the number on the right, it's a... It's in the saturated, it's in the mixture range, okay? Um, and indeed, we said x equals you know, theta minus theta f 
on theta g minus theta f, all right? Theta for us is now specific volume, right? That's what we're, what we're dealing with. Um, the specific volume that we have, 0, 1, 5, 3, 8, 5, minus the value if it was saturated fluid, 0 0.0014. Zero, 0.04 divided by the value if it was a gas, 0 0.02168 minus the value if it was a fluid, conveniently written above. X equals. That's my calculator sound. I agree. Who's that? Excellent. Well done. Carry more photos today. It's about being fast on the keys. Um, I had it written down. So, uh, it can be represented, so it can be represented as a number between 0 and 1 inclusive, um, or it can be represented as a percentage. 6 to 1. Um, excellent. Everyone comfortable with quality? So that means in some container, in this particular container, all right, so we've got some cube container. It's one meter cubed. I imagine it is a cube. All right, there is some small liquid level or liquid droplets in the air at this kind of quality. All right, that much is gas or vapor, and this much is liquid. Such that the mass fraction is 70% of the mass of H2O in the container is a gas. Excellent. Just a note on quality. Um, quality will be specified with, uh, with turbines. So when you buy a turbine, it'll say that it can't handle qualities below 90%, 95%, something like that, right? Because turbines are fast spinning blades in a gas stream, they expect gas and vapor is a gas. So don't think of steam as being little liquid droplets. It's not, that's what we commonly think steam is, but steam is just like air, it's clear um, and it's without droplets. Once you get low quality, you can start damaging your turbo machinery. Okay, so we care about the quality um, of our steam Liquid water transmits heat much faster than vap vaporous water. So heat exchangers, have, you want some liquid in there. Turbines, you don't want any liquid. So there's some implications, but we'll just do calculations with quality. Are there any questions? That sounds like a question. No. Were there any questions about quality? Good. So we've kind of introduced interpolation Interpolation just, uh, it, it confuses people. Um, has anyone heard of interpolation before and done interpolation? Good, I'm seeing 20% of it. Has anyone not done interpolation? I expect the other 80% of the hands to go up. Oof, there's like three times as many hands who haven't, who has, um, made in the, in the yellow you said you had, University? Yeah, before university? Before uni? Okay. Good. We all envy you. Um, we're going to talk... Let me talk conceptually about interpolation. So interpolation is like... All right. Um, you all know where my office is. I was at my office 10 minutes before the hour, and I was here 5 minutes before the hour. So we could draw a line between those and say, well, if those were two data points, and if you've used like a running tracker or whatever, it, it tracks where you are every couple of seconds, 10 seconds, all right? If you said, where was I at, you know, between those times, well, it was between those locations, right? So that's interpolation, where you've got specific data points and you're trying to create new data points between the two data points you have. Interpolation. Um, we need it for our tables because our tables give us 
specific, you know, in this case, it's temperatures, right? But what if you've got a temperature between those two temperatures? What if you've got a pressure between those two pressures? So we need to interpolate um, our data. We've done a couple of questions so far that actually require interpolation, and I just ignored them. It was awesome. One of them was with our water. We calculated the specific enthalpy of water and then said, well, the temperature is between 5 and 10 degrees C. Feels like we should be able to do better than that. Um, we'll interpolate to do better than that. Uh, there's the example we just looked at saying, well, saturated steam passes isentropically through a turbine. What's the end state of the steam and how much work does a turbine produce? We couldn't do it because we didn't know about quality and interpolation. Now we will. And what's the shaft work of the turbine? That's also an interpolation. This is from Wikipedia. It says what I just said. So we're creating, constructing new data points within the range of known data points. Extrapolation, I think I talk about. Extrapolation is like if I was here at 5 to the hour and in my office at 10 to the hour, then yesterday I was in Maroubra. Right? Extrapolation is going outside the data points you have and trying to create new data outside. Sometimes we do it. We don't do it in this subject. Um, you do it in statistics related to a population. You randomly sample a population, 2,000 people answer a thing, and you say, well, based on the answers of these 2,000 people, the Australian population believes this. Right? And, and that's a really difficult... Uh, you have to establish statistical confidence. We don't do that here. We don't extrapolate. We only interpolate. We look at things within a known range. Specifically, we do linear interpolation. Linear interpolation is the easiest type of interpolation, and it assumes that things travel in a straight line. So I actually had to go around the construction for the electrical engineering building to get here, but we just assume I took a straight line. It's close enough for our purposes. Um, um, my, my, one of my best friends is a, is a PhD in physics, um, and he laughs at me when I say linear interpolation, because he does higher order interpolation in an n-dimensional space, and I, like, I glaze over, and I teach interpolation. So, you know, this isn't the hardest it can get. It's actually the, the easiest thing can get. Radio. Here's the formula. I, I don't like formulas. Like, I like concepts. I like visualizations. So I kind of think in terms of the thing on the right, and I just make that one up as I go along. Um, so if you have some known points of property theta, right? and some known prop points of property phi. So this is like theta A might be at a temperature of 300 degrees. At a temperature of 300 degrees, phi might be specific volume. There's a specific volume of 0.1 kilograms per meters cubed. Meters cubed per kilogram. Right? Theta 2 is some other point. So this is 300 degrees. This might be 350 degrees. Okay, so that's how wide your data points are apart. And Phi A was 0 0.1, Phi B might be 0 0.2. Let's make the numbers easy, all right? Then this is saying, okay, at any other temperature, at, any, would I, at a known value of theta, so not 300 and not 350, but at 310, what's the value of Phi? And it assumes that it varies, varies linearly through that, um, through that range, which is good enough for our purposes. So this is linear interpolation, assuming that two things are changing linearly with respect to one another. Um, I'm using fine theta because it's a general term. The actually temperature, specific volume, entropy, whatever it is. Questions? Great. I wasn't in Maroubra last week. Um, so we know the things in green because we read them from the table. All right. This depends on having unknown value here highlighted in yellow. So you can't have both things unknown along that line. You need something to define how far along the line you are, and then you can calculate the unknown value, the thing that you're, you don't know. All right? And that formula can be manipulated to make your unknown phi the subject of the equation. And it looks like, so this is the ratio of this distance here, if you like visualizations, 
to this distance here. And it's a number that varies between 0 and 1, exclusive, I guess. Um, 0 and 1, not inclusive. And so that tells you how far along that um, line it is. This number here, so let's call that A. This number here it relates to, let's call it B, the height or distance of that line, line B. And you need some sort of base point here um, because otherwise you'll get a number between 0 and um, the difference between phi B and phi A. Interpolation. Cool. So, one of the questions was, we calculated the specific enthalpy of water. I've just recreated it there. Um, so we don't have to redo the, the exercise. What's the temperature of water with a specific enthalpy of 28.35 kilojoules per kilogram? Get there first. Oops. Relation tables? Excellent. Good, good. All right. So it's somewhere between 5 and 10 degrees, and that's why we left it last time. Now we know the specific enthalpy at uh, 5 and the specific enthalpy of 10. The formula was right, C2, so T here is our property phi that we're trying to calculate, equals the ratio of what we know minus the lower bound value divided by the higher bound value minus the lower bound value multiplied by the difference in the phi values of the upper, this case temperature, of the upper bound, the lower bound, 10 degrees minus 5 degrees plus 5 degrees. This should become as natural as breathing to you. Um, and you just tap that in a calculator. But does anyone have, so I'll take questions. Yeah. I'll take questions about the concept and kind of about the math. The only difficult thing about the math is reading my, my writing, I hope. Um, but conceptually, can we see that if, if our specific enthalpy was really close to 42, then this number would come out close to 1, that number would come out at 5, and you'd get 5 plus 5. So you get 10 degrees, all right? If the specific enthalpy was really close to 21, then this would come out as zero. That comes out of, as five, of course. And so you get zero times five plus five, and you come close to five degrees, all right? So 28 feels closer to me to 21 than, tw than 42. So I'm expecting I'm a closer to five degrees than it is close to 10 degrees which is a validity check that I always do. And I always make sure I get a value between 10 and 5, right? Because if I get 35 degrees, I go, my math was wrong. I tapped it in the calculator wrong. So have an expectation of the value you think you're going to get. And thank you for calling out the value is 6.75 degrees C. This is a lot of problem solving session three is this kind of question. On a on a graphical value, you've got, um, if you had H here, you'd have 21, 42, 5, 10, 28.35. You'd have a line going there, and the question is, what's the temperature? And the answer is 6.75. So that's temperature. So if we charted it, right, and we wanted to do it graphically, we could think about it in those terms. Excellent. Good. As mentioned, when I just mentioned about quality, right? If we're in the saturated mixture range, then we can calculate x first, and then we can substitute this fraction here. That fraction there can be substituted for x, because x is a form of knowing the ratio of the distance between those two quantities. Um, and then, do I have the formula? Anyway, the formula looks a little bit simpler because you've already, you've already taken out that ratio. 
Good. If you guys don't like doing calculations in class, I don't have to do them. I think it's nice to not just do the conceptual theory. I think it's nice to do at least one of the calculations in class. That's why I do it. But feel free not to. Um, I hope you participate because I think learning is better. So we had steam passing isentropically from 10 megapascals to 1 megapascal. Um, we found that the entropy was going to remain at 5.6. And so it's going to be somewhere in the region between 2.1 and 6.9. Okay? And so the question is, what's the final state of the fluid? And we can do that here. All right? So we say that x is defined as the quantity of the minus... of that ratio, we find that our theta g minus theta f is list, listed for us. It's 4.4482. 4.4482. Okay, so here we're saying phi is entropy s. Don't need to know what entropy is, you just need to know it's a property and we can mathematically deal with the, with the quantity. We had our phi value of 5.6149. We know our phi at fluid, which is 0.1391. All right. So the quality of our steam is? No. That's not what I had. Say again. 78.1. Seventy-eight point one four. Ah, but I have I transcribed the numbers wrong. All right. So we've got a quantity. Uh, so when we describe the state of a fluid, we would now say that the pressure is one megapascal. We would say the temperature is one hundred and seventy-nine point nine degrees C. And we would say that the quality is 78.14%, or represent that as decimal is fine. Okay? So the question said, what is the final state of the fluid? And the answer is this couplet of three properties. We can't just list two properties now because pressure and temperature aren't independent in the saturated range. Go. Good question. Is it the temperature of the fluid or is it the temperature of the gas? Both are at the same temperature and that is the temperature they're at. So in the same way as when you have ice in liquid water, the ice is at zero degrees C, but it's in the solid phase. The water is at zero degrees C and it's in the liquid phase. And as heat's added to the glass over time, some of the ice melts and becomes liquid water at zero C when all the ice is melted, then it goes off zero and starts climbing. Like this is a glass sitting in a, in a room temperature. So yes, the answer is they're both the same temperature, but they have vastly different energies um, because of the, the heat of phase change. It's a great question. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah. Go. Just put me on a related track. Sure, I like that. So the ice is at zero degrees and the water is at zero degrees. Yeah. That's entropy, man. Question was, why doesn't the water freeze? It's true. So from a first law perspective, potentially the water could become hotter and the ice could become colder. Right? You could, temperature could go that way, but it doesn't because entropy must increase in any process. So that's, that's the reason. We'll get there. <laughs> I know. I'm... Don't, don't think I'm avoiding the topic. Not at all. <laughs> I'm hoping you'll all Google it somewhere along the way and just learn it without me. Go. Uh, does, does it matter in the exam which bracket we use to use our like, linear um, values? Yes. Does it matter, should we use the closest one to the point that we're given or should, does it matter? So like on the graph you use one MPA and 10, 
Yes. Yes. That's an excellent question. And I'm, and I'm just about to go there. So yes, the answer is, so the question was, um, for the sake of the recording, because they don't get you guys' comments, right, what if it wasn't 10 MPA, what if it was 9 MPA, or your specific example, what if it was 2.3 MPA at this level of zoom, my handwriting is even worse. Um, what would we then do? We'd do a two-dimensional interpolation and, and we will get there, but I appreciate the question. Um, I like it. Um, go. That one. If we wanted to look at that graphically on a TS chart from Sanderson and Bowles, um, it would look, go, like this. So I just want to get you thinking graphically as well. So we'd have saturated steam at 10 megapascals. This is 100 bar. So that's your 100 bar line, and that's your saturated vapor line. So that defines that state. So you had a fluid at that state. And then isentropically, so without changing the S value, entropy S, isentropically, we reduce the pressure from 100 to uh, 1, sorry, from 100 bar to 10 bar. Sorry, the pressure units are in 10 bar. So that's your 10 bar line there. This line here is 10 bar as well, because it's horizontal in the saturated range, and then the 10 bar line goes down here. Um, so if you reduce it from 100 bar to 10 bar, like that, oopsie daisy, that's so you've gone from state one to state two. And then the question was, what's the quality? You can see this is the 70% line, this is the 80% line, and we're closer to the 80% line than you are to the 70% line. 78% feels right. right. Just want to show this is represented graphically as well as numerically. Um, if that helps anyone. What's the shaft work of the turbine? Is the secondary question. So this is this is what I care about. We've put 2.5 megajoules per kilogram of thermal energy in to this water to make it into steam. We've run it through a turbine. Um, how much work are we getting out of a turbine? The, the calculation for this, which I'll introduce when I talk about um, thermodynamic machines, which is a big topic in itself, is the enthalpy of the final state minus the enthalpy of the initial state. Okay? And so we know the enthalpy of our initial state because it was at 10 megapascals saturated vapor, so 27, 24.7. And we know we can calculate the enthalpy of our final state by using quality as a intermediate measure, right? So our H2 value is going to be 78% of the way towards, ah, oh, I, didn't, I didn't highlight the values, but that's okay. They're the values here. So it's gonna be 78% of the way towards this value from this value, okay? So it'll be 0 0.7814 times by the difference in those two values, which is conveniently listed 2015.3, 2015.3, plus the value that it would have if it was a saturated fluid, which is so listed 762.8, 762.8, So this is using quality x, right? This is our x value. This is our hg minus hf value, okay? And this is our hf value. I've just used that formula from before. And that gives us, I got something beginning with a three eight. Oh, I think I'm wrong. What was you saying? Did you say 2337? Yeah? So the final enthalpy of the fluid 
is 2,337. The work of the turbine then, work of the turbine is the difference between H2, which we've just calculated, and H1, which we can read from the table. 2337.56 minus uh, this value, 2724.7. I'll give you that number. 387.14 kilojoules per kilogram. So, just out of interest from a thermal efficiency perspective, we put 2.5 megajoules per kilogram in, right, 2,500 kilojoules per kilogram, and we got as work out something below 400 kilojoules per kilogram. So, the thermal efficiency of our system isn't very good. Um, there's things we can do to improve the thermal efficiency, and that's why we care about cycles. It's a large part of our job as engineers, trying to make things, right, trying to burn less coal to put more lights on, as it were. Um, but that would be our answer to that question. <sighs> really? Yes, there is. These are around the wrong way. That's meant to be H1 minus H2. I'm really bad with negatives. I'll, I'll get it right when I introduce turbo machinery. Um, then we don't machines. I'm really bad with minuses. I just subtract the numbers and I say, are we getting work out or are we putting work in? Is it plus or minus? So yes, there needs to be a minus there as well. Thank you for that. All right. Few more minutes. I'm going to go to the wire because um, it's only a one-hour session. Go, progress, progress. I say. Excellent. So, what happens if you're not going to a convenient uh, pressure that's listed on the table? 2.3 megapascals was listed as an option. Um, the answer becomes two-dimensional interpolation because one dimension is just not enough. And here's the example of the question. So, what's the enthalpy H? of a saturated mixture, we're given a quality, which tells us how far along the line we need to go. And we're given an unfortunate temperature of 48 degrees, right? So what do we do? We don't have 48, we've got 45 and 50. And so the first thing we do is we work out, well, what would, what would HF be at 48 degrees? And we can calculate that because it'll be somewhere between these two numbers. All right, and slightly closer to the 50 degree number, 48s. Not quite halfway, right? And then what would our Hg at 48 degrees be? And it'll be somewhere between these two numbers, a little bit closer to the bottom, the larger of the two numbers in this case, um, somewhere close to halfway. And then we say, well, then what is the H at 80% at 48 degrees, all right? And that will be 80% of the way between whatever number we got there and whatever number we got there, okay? So that's two-dimensional interpolation and we'll answer the question of, what if it's 2.3? Well, there's a value for two and there's a value for four. 2.3 is closer to two than it is to four and so we can calculate that, yeah. Difference? Difference? Yes. And then add that to the 45 degree value? Yes, absolutely. So that would be linear interpolation? Yes, it would. So yep. So you wouldn't have to add the base value each time. You could add that after the fact as well. Yep, absolutely. So you can interpolate in the two-dimensional space and then bump it up. Yep. Yep. For the purposes of my teaching, I'll try and keep it just using the straight method. Yeah. But yes, absolutely. There's ways to simplify and shortcut. Um, cool. I won't do that calculation, um, but I'll show it in the one note just because I want to tie this up um, before we before we go. Left. Excellent. Good. If the values don't change very much. 
pay attention. This is, this is good to know. If the values don't change very much, there's an alternative to interpolation, which is you can select the closest figure. When I mark exams, I mark on whether you get the right answer or not. All right? So I'm not impressed by fancy equations. For example, if you're asked the question, what's the specific volume of compressed water at 80 degrees and 6 megapascals? Well, at 5 megapascals, it's 0 0.001027. And at 10 megapascals, it's 0 0.001024. Right, so it's changed by three in a thousand, which is 0.3%, right? If you just said 0 0.001026, you're close enough. You could probably say 1027, right? I probably, dis I probably disagree with my academic colleagues on this matter, um, but the assumptions we're making in thermodynamics about things like adiabatic are so far wrong that the error that you introduced by guessing between these two figures is, is not where the error in your calculation is coming from. Um, so you can do that in an exam, I think I gave like a 1% tolerance. So if you're doing things like that, where your worst is 0.3% and you need to be aware of the compounding factor of when you take that calculation further on, um, you will be fine. That's what we've got. That should get you through PSS 3. Sorry, I didn't cover it earlier.